Okay. Welcome back. I feel like I get in a rut. I say that okay over and over again. And maybe you don't want to be back. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to say something very confusing now. And you're probably not going to get it at first. I don't mean that as a slight against you. I just mean what I'm going to say is confusing. We talked previously about the minimum work principle. Now, we're going to introduce a maximum work principle and say that they're equivalent. And I'm going to say a few terms that seem contradictory and I um, hope I can clarify them. Okay. So in 1951, Bishop and Hill introduced a maximum work principle. Okay. <clears throat> this maximum work principle says that out of all the available multiaxial stress states that activate a minimum of five subsystems, the one that is operative is going to be the one that maximizes the work done. Previously, we said we're going to choose the slip systems by minimizing the work done. Okay. Let's see if we can rectify this a little bit. So, in terms of <clears throat> the minimum work, we have a prescribed deformation. Right? We want our grain to deform in a certain way. And the minimum work principle says, I want to do the least amount I have to do to get there. I want to have the least amount of shear necessary to get there. I don't want to do any extra slip, right? I have to move dislocations to do slip. Moving dislocations takes energy. I want to do the the minimum the minimum possible, right? We're all good with that. Bishop and Hill here are talking about stress. They're not talking about how the the strain itself uh, is partitioned, right? That the stress state that activates a minimum of five slip systems, right? The one that is active is going to be the one that does the most work. Okay. So what are we saying? Right? What is work? Right? Force times distance. All right. In terms of vectors, it's F dot D. It's the projection of force onto the distance. So how do we maximize the work done for a given amount of force? We make it parallel with the deformation. So really what Bishop and Hill are saying is that we're looking for the stress state that is parallel with the strain. We want our st principal axes of stress to be aligned with the principal axes of strain in our grain. If that happens... Right? That is going to be the stress state that then causes the deformation. The deformation is going to be caused by picking the five slip systems that need the minimum amount of work to get to that deformation. But the stress is going to be chosen by the one that, out of all the possible stress states, the stress state is going to be the one that is closest to um, parallel with the, with the strain direction. Now, what Bishop and Hill did was a really clever thing. They found out that they could enumerate every possible stress state in a polycrystal. 
Turns out there's only 28 of them, right? So this list of uh, multi-axial stress states is actually pretty small, right? So for Taylor, we had to look at 96 possible combinations, and there wasn't any guarantee that our solution was unique. For Bishop and Hill, we only have to look through 28, and we know our solution is unique. Uh, so. Uh, but that's it. So it turns out that maximum work is equivalent to the minimum work or minimum shear. It's super confusing. I know. Try not to hold it against me. Once you work in this field for about five years, it'll be really, really intuitive and obvious. Okay. So what did Bishop and Hill do? They... Um, five deviatoric stress terms, they define them in this kind of funny way, right? This is the stress, this is the resolved shear stress. Right? These are the Schmidt terms. Right? The components of the Schmidt tensor. Uh, right, and we can find these uh, these coefficients. Um, the mathematics is not is not super important. Okay, but this is called the E matrix, right? It just contains all of the relevant Schmidt information, and. Uh, We set this up, right? These are our stresses here. This is our Schmidt information. These are our resolved stresses on the slip systems. Okay. So if the determinant of this is non-zero, it means we have a solution. Right. <clears throat> so if we assume a fixed critical resolved shear stress, it means that out of this set of linear independent combinations of slip, we can actually uh, compute uh, them all. We can enumerate them all. Right? We can compute all of the possible stress states. Okay, so 96 sets of five independent slip systems from Taylor. Okay. If we take these sets of shears, Right, I mean, but the stress computed for them cap it collapses down to only 28. So in previous years, I went through this and went through this derivation and then had people do homework with it. And I don't think they actually actually added anything to anyone's understanding. So I I dropped that out last year and this year. Um, if you want to see more, uh, we can talk, but I, I can almost guarantee you that no one no one will take me up on that. Um, but anyway, we can work through the math and we come up with 28 possible stress states. Right? And what Bishop and Hill did is they put them on the table. Right? They basically you can look at if you're this is the first stress state. This is the activity of the slip systems. And notice there's eight or six, right? So this is the stress state. These are the active slip systems, <clears throat> right? And so what we can then do is calculate the work increment for each one of those stress states. We know the strain increment. We know the stress state that we can give us the work, okay? We can compute it from the table. These are the components, the five components of the deviatoric stress from the table, okay? So we have to consider both positive and negative copies of the stress state, 
right? Because the stress could be either tensile or compressive. Right? Uh, we're going to find the one that maximizes the work done, and that's the stress state in our grain. Right? <clears throat> so Bishop and Hill did a whole lot of theory to come up to a really simple numerical approach to determine from the deformation gradient what the stress is going to be. So a couple key points to remember. The strain needs to be in the crystal frame, and we normalize the strain increment so that the von Mises strain is 1. So, we'll work through an example with Bishop and Hill uh, in class. But, um, if you dig into this deeper, there's a really important ratio that pops up. This is called the, the Taylor factor. All right? And it... It was the ratio between the uh, the macroscopic stress and the critically resolved shear stress. Right. So the von Mises stress that's applied, the scalar stress divided by the critically resolved shear stress in the grain, is the Taylor factor. It also relates the sh the sum of all the shears in the slip system to the von Mises strain increment or the macroscopic versus microscopic work, right? So this is the applied, this is the work done in the grain, right? These are all measures of how easy a grain is to deform. And it's named after uh, uh, Taylor factor. So, <clears throat> Taylor factor comes into actually how we use, it, it's, a, it's a really useful measure. Anytime you do forming work, they always talk about the Taylor factor of grains uh, to, look at, to look at how things, uh, um, how things are going to be deformed, right? how heterogeneous your deformation is going to be in a scan. You can calculate this from EBSD. If you assume a, a strain increment, you can do this analysis and calculate what the Taylor factor for all the different grains are going to be by figuring out which slip systems are going to be activated. And then you can color like an EBSD map by the Taylor factor. All right, and it's going to tell you, based on the polycrystal that you're looking at, how heterogeneous your uh, um, deformation is going to be in that structure. All right, that's built-in default analysis in the microscopy. Okay, so how do we use all this? All right, so this is pseudocode for how you work a Bishop Hill problem, right? And maybe it'll make a little more sense. Okay, so we identify the orientation of our crystal. We have a strain that we're applying, so we transform that to the crystal coordinates. We compute the work increment of each of the 28 stress states, plus and minus, so we have to do the 56. Okay. The operative work is the operative stress state is the one that is associated with the largest magnitude of the work increment. Right? That also tells us which either six or eight slip systems are going to be activated. Okay? Right, and then the Taylor factor is then equal to the maximum work increment divided by the von Mises uh, equivalent strain. Okay. okay, so what do we have now? If we assume a deformation, Taylor and Bishop Hill allows us to decide which slip systems are going to be active and what the stress state of the grain is going to be. But what Taylor or Bishop Hill doesn't tell us is what are the 
slip rates on each of the subsystems. Right? We know eight slip systems are active, but are they all deforming at the same rate? Or are there are or can they are there is there a unique way to decompose it? And the answer is no. Taller or Bishop Hill doesn't say anything um, ab about that. All right? It's impossible to get a unique solution for the actual rates on the active slip systems. For that, we need uh, more sophisticated modeling like that. Right? This the common way to do it is to do that viscoplastic. Power, uh, power law plasticity, put that into a finite element model. Um, and do that way. It turns out to get the rates, we need to consider the uh, equilibrium, stress equilibrium as well. Right? To make the problem unique. Um, so... Right, but uh, yeah, it's it's an amazing bit of theoretical mechanics that that this all came out so nicely. Right, I think if you asked someone before you learn this, what are the possible stress states in a polycrystal? Right, the fact that you can only have twenty eight in FCC is probably sounds absurd, but Life is sometimes absurd, I guess. I don't know. Okay. So, we could turn this Taylor theory into a really pretty good model of how a polycrystal deforms. So, we have to assume something about the hardening, right? We have to assume a hardening model. So, typically with Taylor, we'll say that the critical resolve shear stress is a function of the accumulated shear strain in each grain, right? So, but regardless of the hardening model, the work done uh, in each strain increment has to be the same, right? Whether we calculate it from the macro scale or from the sum of the slip systems, right? So, we could use this Taylor factor to relate as a relationship between the critically resolved shear stress as a function of our strain to our stress, right? And that, this is Taller, 1937, right? It allows us to compute, it allowed him to compute a stress strain curve, basically, for a, a, a polycrystal with a small number of grains, right? And, uh, so that's, right, pretty remarkable, and even though it's pretty lucky that he got as, as close as he did. You know, I wonder, you always wonder how many calculations, how many polycrystals did he calculate by hand before he got one that worked really well. But, all the same, it's, uh, a classic, a classic result, All right? Um, basically, I'm not going to cover the details of lattice orientation, right? How polycrystals rotate, but uh, Taller makes um, predictions that are very similar to uh, uh, single crystal. Right, a single slip, right? So the grains will tend to rotate in approximately the same way they will in a single crystal under tensile or compressive loading, um, but not, not exactly. Okay, we're going to stop there. Multiple slip is very different than single slip. Uh, Multi-axial stress states are required to activate multiple slip. For cubic metals, there's a finite list of the possible multi-axial stress states. The minimum work is equivalent to the maximum work. 
or the minimum microscopic slip Taylor theory is equivalent to the maximum work approach given by Bishop and Hill. And even if we solve the stress states, we're still left with some ambiguity about the rates on each of the slip systems, right? The distribution of slip on the different systems, how much, how much slip is occurring, right? All right, think about this ambiguity, right? We said we need five slip systems to accommodate any arbitrary deformation, All right? So five will get us there. The Bishop and Hill tells us there's either six or eight of them active, depending on what stress state. So that means the amount that each one there's an infinite possible ways you can arrange the amount of shear on those eight slip systems to give you the same deformation, right? You're, you're back to the underdetermined system. You know which ones are deforming. You just don't know how it's partitioned among the, those eight. And so we, we need to use a rate sensitive uh, type model to, uh, to resolve that ambiguity. Okay, I'm giving a bunch of uh, supplemental slides here about, I mentioned, you know, we need to rotate the strain to the crystal frame. These are just some notes on how that works. And I took these from uh, Professor Tony Rollett, right, who has an awesome course on texture and anisotropy, which I hope to run a variant of that uh, here someday, but we... It talks about how we describe the orientations in terms of Euler angles and how to write the crystal transformation matrices uh, to do all that. Okay, that's a lot to get through. So, but hopefully it's a fun topic.